Well, congregation, family, and friends, I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to this edition of Bible Study. Tonight, we're going to talk about two people who made a decision. It was a bad decision. The decision cost them their lives. And so I've titled this Bible study, Deadly Decision. If you have your Bibles with you, we will be in Acts chapter 5 tonight. We're going to look at a husband and wife. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. And they did something really bad and it cost them their lives. And what I want us to see is not only what they did, but that we also need to consider some of the things that we do in our lives, some of the decisions that we make that are probably less than wise, and maybe even some decisions that may lead to our own destruction. And so if you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 5. I want to break it down into two sections because we first have to deal with Ananias, who is the husband. And then we're going to deal with Sapphira. But you're going to see some things that they have in common. And that is that they conspired together to do something wrong. Now, before we get into that, if you go back and you read the last part of Acts chapter 4, it talks about that all of the believers came together and everything that they had was put into this gigantic pot. And, and it says that they had all things in common. And it was to then distribute out to other people who had need of things. We look in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And so we have this situation that has been established that if they were bringing things in, that automatically 100% everything was given into this gigantic pot where it could then be redistributed for those that had need. That's the situation. And that's what makes this decision that Ananias and Sapphira uh, commit, the, this idea that they have, it makes it even more insidious. So if you're with me, we're in Acts chapter 5. Now there is the, now let me go back and do this again in, in, in verse 36 and 37 of Acts chapter 4 because you know there was no chapter breaks and no uh, uh, verses when the original had written the Bible. And so it gets a little, sometimes the breaks aren't exactly where they should be. So let's pick it up in Acts 4 verse 36. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, who owned a large tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So that's what Joseph is doing. Now let's pick up Acts 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and they kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what do we see automatically, the first thing that's going wrong? The first thing that's wrong is we looked at Joseph, this Levite, who sold a tract of land and brought everything that he had made on it right and laid it at the apostles' feet. He was doing what other people were doing, bring everything they have, give everything over to God so that it can then be dispersed. But what did we see Ananias and Sapphira doing? First of all, they conspired to sell something but not give God everything. They didn't give God everything. They conspired because it says Ananias with his wife's full knowledge. He said he kept back part of himself to himself in verse 2. and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge while bringing a portion of it and brought it to the apostles' feet. So they talked about it beforehand. They made this deadly decision that was going to cost them their lives. They made a bad decision. They decided that they were going to keep a little bit for themselves. There's no acknowledgement here, not being grateful that God gave them something to sell in the first place or that he had blessed them in any way, shape, or form. None of that. But they came up with this idea, and it's called greed. And we see that all through the Bible, and don't you know we see it even in today's world? Perhaps that's something that you wrestle with, greed. We know that uh, businesses and corporations and it goes all to the tax structure and everything else. It just seems like greed is everywhere. We're always trying to squeeze a little bit more out. 
You know, Matthew was one of the apostles, and he was a tax collector. Well, he certainly suffered from greed, because not only was he collecting the taxes for the Roman, but he was lining his own pockets by squeezing the people. That's greed. And so we have Ananias and Sapphira here in Acts 5, and they're following suit, but not exactly the same. So they decide that they're going to sell what they have and keep a portion back for themselves, and he had his wife's full knowledge. Not only was Ananias the head of his household, he was responsible for his wife. But he brought his wife in on this, and his wife agreed to it. And look what happens. There's, it's not long before they are rebuked, before they are corrected. Let me go back and read it again. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? A very logical question. Why has Satan filled your heart? God didn't do it. Satan filled his heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, Ananias is bringing this information he's bringing this offering to the apostles feet but peter is saying no you didn't you're not lying to me you're lying to the holy spirit because this movement was of god verse four now we ask ananias a couple more questions he says while it remained unsold that is the property you had while it remained unsold did it not remain your own and after it was sold was it not under your control in other words it was totally yours before you sold it and it was still yours you were still in charge after you sold it you had the perfect right to make whatever decision you wanted when it was under your control it belonged to you you could do whatever you wanted with it and even after it was sold it still was in your jurisdiction it was still up to you what to do with it well you made a bad decision ananias ananias look what he says verse four while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Of course it did. It was his. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. That is a devastating sentence. And we'll look in a moment what the reaction is to that. Peter is saying, you have conceived this thing in your heart. Remember when Jesus was talking about all these vile things that come out of our heart. Adulteries and cheating and all kinds of things come out of the heart. So he's saying, you conceived this in the heart. It started in the heart, and then it went to his mind, and then he shared that idea with his wife, Sapphira, and now all of a sudden, both of them are in on it. You see how this works? You see how sin starts. It starts right here. It starts here, and then it goes to here, and we start thinking about it. We start playing with it, and then in their case, it came out. He had this idea. His wife had full knowledge of it, so he would have had to have spoken to her, and now Peter asks a series of questions. Ananias, please note that there is no response from Ananias. He has no defense. He cannot say anything in his defense. And so Peter asks him a series of questions here. He asks him three questions. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? Question number one. Question two. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? That's question two. Question three. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? There's three straight questions and then four. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? Four questions. No answers. No rebuttal. No defense. It's, it, it's as if it, there's no way he can defend his actions. And then Peter kind of goes in with that last devastating statement. He says, you have not lied to men. You haven't lied to me or the other apostles. You lied to God. You lied to God, and look what happens. The very next thing, this is what his decision to hold some money back cost him. Verse 5, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down, breathed his last, and then great fear came over all who heard it. The last 
words that Ananias heard in his life on this earth was, you have not lied to men, but God. Ananias, you have lied to God. And immediately he fell down dead. Judgment, instant judgment. Was his decision worth it? Was holding back a little bit from God really worth it? Cost him his life. He made a bad decision, a deadly decision, and he paid the price for it. And you'll notice because of the judgment that came upon him, the Bible says that great fear came over all of those that, were, that had heard this. Great fear came over all who have heard of it. Yeah, I'd have great fear too if suddenly this man is standing there and he gets rebuked, cannot defend his actions, and the last thing he hears, imagine, imagine the last thing you would hear on this earth is something like, Thomas, you haven't lied to men or you haven't cheated men. You cheated God. You lied to God. You didn't serve God. You didn't obey God. Any of those could be a variation. And I'm telling you, I don't want to hear that as the last words in my life on this earth because the next thing I'm facing is judgment seat right before God. I have to stand before God and give an account for my life. I don't want to hear those words. I'm sure you don't want to hear those words. As we're looking at Ananias, let's start to think about some of the decisions that we make in our life. Some of the decisions that could very well cost us our life. Do we, are we making decisions that are God-honoring? Are we making decisions that will benefit the kingdom of God? Are we being responsible with the money that God has given us? Are we using the things that he's given us for the kingdom of God to bless others with? Or are we hoarding it for ourselves? Are we holding back something that we really should be giving to God? Well, we're only halfway through the story. So we want to keep looking at this. Now, look what happens to him. As he heard these words, verse 5, Ananias fell down, he breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. Now look what happens. Verse 6, the young men got up, they covered him up, they carried him out, and they buried him. Wow, inauspicious ending. Pretty sad ending, isn't it? They covered him, they lifted him up, they carried him out of the room, and they buried him. Just like that. That quick. Judgment is made. He's buried. Now you got to wonder. He never had a chance to repent. Think about it. He never had a chance to ask God for forgiveness. He never had a chance to repent of his sins. He's dead. He's going to stand before the judgment seat of God and have to give an account for his life. Let's be very, very careful, my friends, when we are living our life and some of the decisions we make. Because we never know when our last breath is. We never know when God is going to call us home. And we always want to make sure that we are right with God. We need to confess those sins. We need to make sure that we're clean before God. If we're a child of God, then Jesus has paid for all of our sins. But that doesn't mean we can just go out and do whatever we want and just sin all over the place. No. We are called to live a life of holiness. We are called to live a life of obedience. And we are called to live a life of service. Ananias didn't do any of that, did he? He wasn't obedient. He wasn't serving anyone but himself. Oh, he was making a grand gesture. Sure, I'll bring some over, but I'm not going to give all of it. I'm keeping some for myself. Now watch what happens. Ananias is now gone. He's done. Look what happens in verse 7. Now there elapsed an interval of three hours. And his wife came in not knowing what happened. Somehow or other, Sapphira does not know what happened to her husband. There's a three-hour gap in between his death and her coming in to the apostles. But she's going to get rebuked also because remember, back in verse 1 or verse 2, didn't it say that she had full knowledge of the scheme? She was in it up to her eyeballs. She was in full knowledge, and she agreed to this. So now she comes in and has no idea what happened to her husband. You think her fate is going to be any better than her husband's? Watch. Verse 8. Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. 
And she said, yes, that was the price. Now, she just lied to Peter. She just lied to the apostle. Peter is testing her. He's giving her a chance to repent. He's giving her a chance to get it straight and just confess what happened. So he's saying, the land that you had, did you sell it for so and so over price, such and such? And she says, yes, that was the price. But it wasn't the price. She lied. Remember, she didn't know what happened to her husband. Now look what happens in verse 9. Then Peter said to her, here's another question. Why is it that you have agreed together, this is you and your husband, to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Why did you do that? Why did you two tempt the Holy Spirit? Why did you come together to tempt the Holy Spirit of the Lord and put him to the test? Do you think that God wasn't going to know what you're doing? And we have to look at our lives. Do you think that God doesn't know everything that you and I do, everything that you and I say? Everywhere we go, all of our thoughts, all the things that come out of our heart, all the things come out of our mouth. Do you think God is not aware of all that? He sure is. He knows all of it. Now he's asking Sapphira, and guess what? She doesn't have an answer either. She's not answering. Let me ask a question again in verse 9. He says, why is it that you have agreed together, you and your husband, to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Now, here comes the devastating news. Here comes the first news that something happened to Ananias. He says, behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. Can you imagine the very last words she's going to hear is, the feet of those who buried your husband. Can you imagine that emotional impact? Your husband is dead. Your husband is already buried. And those men who buried your husband within these last three hours since you saw him last, these same men are going to carry you out as well. That is a death sentence. Immediately, that is judgment. The very last thing that she hears is your husband is dead and you're about to join him because you're going down also. Devastating. All because of a very bad decision. A deadly decision. So look what happens to her. Verse 10, and immediately, not later, immediately, she fell at his feet, whose feet? Peter's feet, and breathed her last. Instant judgment, just like her husband. And the young men came in, they found her dead, they carried her out, and they buried her beside her husband. Ananias and Sapphira, this happened 2,000 years ago. And we're still talking about it tonight. These people are in the Bible, not because of something great that they did. They're in the Bible as an example of what not to do. What not to do. So the very last words that he hears is, you haven't lied to men, but you've lied to God, and he dies. The last word she hears is, the young men who buried your husband are going to bury you too. Instantly now they're both dead. Now she is going to have to stand before God and give an account for her life. No chance of repentance. You may look at this and say, now wait a minute, isn't God kind of harsh? I mean, was that a harsh punishment? Well, first of all, I am not God, neither are you. And we can't pretend to understand God and understand his thought process and what he feels is right and wrong. It's obvious when we read the previous chapter, it is obvious that they tried to pull something over on the apostles. The apostles, Peter was given that insight. He knew what was going on. That would have been insight from the Holy Spirit himself. And Peter had asked each one of them, and I believe this, that he asked them questions. And I believe that had they repented and confessed what they did, they would have still been alive. Because the same thing happens with you and I. If we repent of our sins, if we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says what? If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These two, this husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, they did not confess their sin. So their sins were not cleaned up. They had no forgiveness. And Peter asked each one of them a question. And at any time, they could have jumped in and said, you're right. 
Apostle Peter, you're right. Yes, we held something back. When he asked Sapphira, did you sell the land for so-and-so price? If she really meant business with God, she would have said, no, we, we sold it for more and we hold it back. We held it back. But she didn't. She stuck to the lie. She stuck to the bad decision and it cost her her life. So now we have a situation where just a, a few hours before, there are two people alive, a husband and wife. They scheme. They make a bad decision. And within three hours, they're both dead. Now, I don't know if that scares you. I don't know if it gets you, causes you to open your eyes or something. And every time I go through this story and every time I see this and I see the impact of what happens and the instant judgment, it freezes me in my tracks and it makes me stop and think, Lord, if, 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 if there's a sin that's unconfessed, if I did something or said something or, or, or I'm thinking something that's not in your will, that's not, that, and I, I, well, I need to seek his forgiveness the same way that you need to. We don't want this kind of thing on our record when we go into eternity. I don't want the last words to be hearing that I lied to God or I didn't serve God. Or God called me to do something and I just refused. Or God, the Holy Spirit, led me to give so much to a church or a charity and I didn't do it. Or I thought I knew better than God and so I decided, well, I'll give what I want to give and I'll keep some for myself. Behold. What are we learning from this? Okay, let's look at the aftermath of all this. After she's buried beside her husband. Verse 11. And God emphasizes this again for a reason. It says, and great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Now, didn't we hear this after the first one was dead? The first one was dead. In verse 5, it says, great fear came over all who heard it. And now we go to verse 11. And again, it says, and great fear came over the whole church. This, this, this story is even spreading, even wider. And I believe that part of this whole church, you and I, looking at this today. If you ever heard this passage preached on, I'm sure you have. I've preached on it before. Everywhere we hear about this, the whole church should have great fear. This is a God who is merciful and just, but he is also a God of judgment. And if we want to play around with the very God who created us, the very God who sent his son to die for us, we want to play around with that kind of God? You want to play around with God? You want to play games with God? I sure don't. I sure don't. And so I'm looking at this situation here with these two people. And simply because they were greedy, Simply because they lied, simply because they held back some money. They did not do what everyone else was doing because they came up with a scheme, because the devil tempted them and they allowed the devil to use them. They're both dead. And we all know that once we leave this earth, once we take our last breath, once we are beyond salvation, the next thing we do is stand before God for judgment. And God will judge how we lived our life. Do we, did we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior? If he did, and we have the blood upon us, Jesus' blood, then all of our sins are forgiven and we get, gain entry into heaven. If we don't have Jesus, then there's another place that people are going to go to. People don't like hearing about that. But as, as we're closing out this Bible study, it, it is, I, I would be remiss if I did not ask you to make sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Make sure, because if tonight is your last night here on earth, if this is the last sermon you ever hear, or Bible study, if this is the last broadcast you watch, if by the end of the night you're in eternity and you are not saved and Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, it's all over. There's no opportunity on the other side to go before God and say, you know, I was, I was meaning to believe in Jesus. I just never got around to it. Or I, I lived my life my own way. I figured when I was old and in my sickbed, I would repent. You'd save me and we'd be good. You, we can't, we can't, you can't live life that way. I can't, you can't. And so let me just share this to you as, as, as we're closing out. I pray that everyone who's watching this or listening to it, that you know, without a doubt, that you are a child of God, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that you have the gift of eternal life, that all of your sins have been paid for and forgiven, and that you are living a life of obedience and holiness, that you are living a life that is pleasing to God, 
and that whatever he's called you to do in this life to serve the kingdom and serve the Lord Jesus Christ that you are doing it and you're doing it to the very best of your ability you're doing it in, with integrity and honesty and hard work because there's no more important thing in this world than to serve the Lord Jesus because we're going to be with him forever so let us learn from these two people let us learn from this husband and wife who made a bad decision they made a deadly decision let's let's really be conscious of the decisions that we make in our life to make sure that we don't make a deadly decision because it could cost us our eternal life I pray this Bible study has helped you. If it has, please feel free to share it. God says in Isaiah 55, 11, he says, my word is not going to return void. It's going to reach all those he intends it to reach. So if this reached you tonight, if it ministered to you tonight, then this message, this Bible study was for you. And if you know someone else that needs to hear this, please feel free to share. This is the word of God. We're supposed to share the word of God. This has nothing to do with me. This has to do with the word of God going forward. And so I would encourage you to share this with as many people as you can if you think that they would be interested in opening and hearing it. Also, you know, I'm going to say it. We need to be Bereans. Acts 17, 11 tells us about the Berean people. It says they were more noble than all others. They weren't smarter. They weren't nicer looking. They didn't have more money. They weren't economically advantaged. No. What they did was, and read about it, it's in Acts 17, verses 10, 11, and 12. What they did in Acts 11 is they received the word. They received the preaching of Paul and Silas. They received the Bible studies. They received the word of God with all readiness. They were open in their minds, in their hearts. Their eyes and ears were open. They wanted to hear the word. But they didn't stop there. Because we can't just be hearers of the word only, James tells us. We have to be doers also. So what did they do? They then searched the scriptures daily. Look it up, Acts 17, 11. They searched the scriptures daily, every day, not once a week, not just on Sunday when the pastor preaches a message and you open your Bibles for 30 minutes. No. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. I encourage you, do the same thing. Be a faithful and diligent Berean. Take the information that I gave you here and check it out for yourself and study it for yourself. Anyone that you happen to watch on Christian television, listen to on Christian radio, someone on social media, maybe you belong to a local church, maybe you go to a Bible study, maybe you're reading the bestseller of your latest favorite Christian writer. Wherever you are being fed the word of God, wherever that is being absorbed, you owe it to yourself to take down the references, take down the main points, and study the Bible for yourself. Because I'll tell you what will happen. The more you study scripture, the more easily you will be able to discover those who are not preaching truth, who are not bringing truth, who are bringing deceptions, who are false Christs, false prophets, and all of those ugly things that Jesus talked about in the end days. They're here. I see them all the time, particularly on social media. There's false prophets everywhere. They're saying any old thing. You owe it to yourself to make sure that what you're hearing and what you're being taught and what is being preached is from the Word of God and can be proven by the Word of God. If you learn nothing else from me ever in all of these hundreds of broadcasts, please learn that. Lastly, would you please keep this ministry in your prayers? As you can imagine, because I tend to be a little bold and a little loud at times, uh, this ministry comes under attack a lot by Satan and those who do not want this ministry to stay on the air, does not want me in preaching in local pulpits, does not want me traveling for the Lord or anything else that I've been doing for 30 years. The devil was always attacking. And as a result of that, we need your prayers to stay firm on the front lines. I want to stay right there on the front line, boldly preaching the word of God. No retreat, no sugarcoating. I don't tap dance around certain verses and certain topics. If God talks about it, if it's in the Bible, I'm preaching it and I'm teaching it. It's as simple as that. Some people are afraid, oh, if I preach on hell and damnation, I may lose my congregation or the money will stop coming in. Well, that's between them and God. They have to answer for that. But I'm called and we are called to preach the whole counsel of God, not just the parts we like. And so please keep this ministry in your prayers because we need to stay strong and on the front lines. We have taken tremendous financial hits. And I'm just telling you this in case God would lead you to help us financially. This is a walk of faith. There's income coming in elsewhere. But this is a walk of faith. There's no salary here. I don't get paid for doing this. 
But if God would lead you to help us financially, and again, that's between you and God. You don't have to do that. You don't have to sow a seed here. You don't have to pay for a prophetic utterance. You don't have to do any of that. But if God would lead you to support us, you can do it if you're on Facebook here, right through Facebook Messenger. It's quick, it's easy, safe, and secure. We also have a mailing address, a corporate address that we could give you if you want to send something in. We had a website. It went down. If you're watching this and we're in early November, we lost our website on October 30th or 31st, the last day of October. We could not afford to keep it. And so we're in the process of creating a new one. Uh, hopefully for free and hopefully uh, it will fit with our budget and our budget is zero. So uh, we lost our website and I can't give you that website anymore. That's just one of the things we had to make a decision on because of uh, our support level just wasn't there. But let me just say this to you. If you don't support us at all and that's your conviction, that's fine. That's between you and God. I still want you to come back for every broadcast. We're not on as often as I would like to be and as often as we were because, again, we're, we have to work in other areas to make up and, and have a living, just make a living. So it can't be out here as much as I was before. I would love to be. Maybe God will allow that again someday. But for right now, that's not possible. So please keep us in your prayers, and if God leads you to support us, we'd be ever so grateful. I pray that this Bible study helped you tonight. Learn to make good, healthy decisions, not deadly decisions. See you again soon. God bless you.